uh, good evening everyone welcome to the fifth session of master classes in critical care medicine from ashoda hospitals in association with uh, iscm hyderabad chapter today's uh, topic for discussion is uh, traumatic brain injury uh, the case is going to be presented by dr sumaya ruhi she is finally a dnd student from continental hospital hyderabad and we have another student dr anwar ahmed he is a dnb finally a student from uh, apollo hospitals jubilees they both will be presenting the case and we have the we have the senior faculty as examiners uh, dr ramraj gopalan sir he is the director and professor of the clinical services critical care medicine ramchandra hospitals chennai and another examiner senior consultant dr gansham he is director uh, senior consultant of critical care medicine from medicore hospitals hyderabad dr sumaya rohi you can start the presentation Shall I start the screen sharing, sir? Yeah. Starting. Yes, sir. One second. Is my screen seen, sir? All right. uh good evening everyone uh, so the case for today we have a 17 year old male who met with a road traffic accident around 8:40 in the morning and he was received in the er around 10 am that day the mechanism of injury which they narrated was uh, he was se uh, seated behind the driver and was not wearing a seat belt the car hit the divider and the patient suddenly hit the window and collided with the driver's seat the complaints they came with was decreased response bleeding from left ear nose oral cavity and bleeding also from the left side of the eyelid on asking there was no history of vomiting or seizures on further examination primary survey airway there was pooling of secretions and blood spine was secured with cervical collar simultaneously so in view of uh, uh, Poor airway. If uh, the patient was intubated with rapid sequence intubation and manual inline stabilization. Further examination: the breathing. It showed bilateral symmetrical chest movements. He was breathing at a at a rate of twenty per minute. Air entry was equal on both sides on auscultation. He was maintaining saturation of ninety eight percent after intubation. Further. Uh, in circulation, he was maintaining a heart rate of eighty five per minute. bp recorded was 100 over 60 after which immediately the fluid boluses of 500 ml twice were given simultaneous the ongoing assessment showed capillary refilling time of less than 2 seconds and feeble peripheral pulses on reassessment after two bolus of fluids of 500 ml each the bp picked up to 118 over 64 ml of mercury His GCS recorded before intubation was E1, B2, M5. Pupils bilateral. Uh, on the right, it was 2 mm, which was reacting to light. Left was 3 mm and not reacting to light. The GRBS recorded at that point of time was 155 milligram per deciliter. The temperature was 97 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, there was bleeding from the left side of the eyelid and nose and the left ear. there was uh, no external deformities as such after few seconds when analyzed the chest and pelvic compression test were negative yeah. up to this point this is what i would call emergency medicine and i'm not going to focus on this aspect of uh, the care of the patient i uh, hope that you will be taking on the management of the patient after the emergency physicians have taken it on So yes. I won't ask you any questions at this stage. You just go ahead. Go ahead with your presentation. Yeah. Yes. Secondary survey, head to toe, or toe the detail examination. The GCS recorded was like I told E1, B2, M5. Pupils were unequal. The left one not reacting to light. He was moving all four limbs. Uh, there was left ear and nasal bleed, oral bleed, abrasions all over the face and the left eyelid. The uh, chest, uh, serious abdomen examination was normal. uh the extent genitalia were also normal the long bones on examination there was no extent deformity 
the list of injuries overall we saw was uh, the laceration of the bridge of nose on the glabella periorbital edema and uh, laceration of the left cheek abrasions and some soft tissue swelling oral nasal bleed and some abrasions on the elbow the patient after uh, having good response to fluid and all that was taken up for ct polytrauma as per the hospital protocol uh, the picture here i show here shows a right paratoxipital sdh uh, the detailed report which was given showed a right paratoxipital sdh with midline shift of 2 mm with multiple parenchymal hemorrhages uh, reported as grade 2 diffuse axonal injury and having mild cerebral edema apart from this he had bilateral nasal bone fractures nasal septum fracture bilateral maxillary sinus fracture uh, left orbital lateral bone comminuted fracture and displaced which was a displaced bone fracture go ahead the okay. treatment that he received in er overall uh, two units of fluid bolus followed by maintenance also uh, tranexa 1 g iv stat was given followed by infusion Injection levetiracetam one gram IV was given. Injection ceftriaxone one gram IV stat was given. Also simultaneously, the cross consultations were raised to a neurosurgeon, ENT surgeon, ophthalmologist, and OMFS. Okay, good over here. I mean, this is a good time to start asking okay. questions. Okay, the emergency treatment that was provided in the ER. Okay, my questions that I will ask you is, what do you agree with and what do you disagree with? I presume that the IV fluid bolus was the two units that you gave initially when it was slightly hypotensive, yes. maybe showing you. After that, they have not given any further boluses because there is no other warrant for a continued uh, um, fluid resuscitation aggressively. Twenty mL per kg per hour uh, for a sixty kilo individual is how much roughly? Uh, one one point two liters per hour. One point two liters per hour. Per hour. Okay, is that warranted at all? Is it warranted at all? He was a lean, thin guy, around forty-two kg, sir. Mm. So around uh, eighty ml, ml per, per kg. Eighty ml per kg uh, per hour was the fluid that was maintained. No, you're saying twenty ml per kg per hour. That is almost twenty into forty will be eight hundred ml 800. per hour. This was started okay. in yeah, yes, sir. It looks like somebody is in an aggressive fluid resuscitation mode. Yeah, go ahead. Because you you say there are no other injuries. It looks like it is a sole. Head injury and facial maxillary injury. Yes. There was some amount of bleeding at that time, but initially the patient is extremely stable looking. Otherwise, okay. do you think that that volume resuscitation is a good choice? I think initial boluses were required, but the maintenance is like little on the aggressive side. Even the initial so maintenance. Do you, do you feel that one liter of fluid in the initial period was also necessary? Uh, uh, heart rate. There was a marginal decline. Yeah. Go ahead. Heart rate and uh, respiratory rate were almost normal, but the BP was closely lying and falling in the second class of hemorrhagic uh, shock. So approximately seven hundred fifty to fifteen hundred of blood loss. So, so point tachycardia. So. Didn't even have tachycardia, right? It didn't even yes, have sir. tachycardia Not when he was lying down. Tachycardia except for the low BP. And, and it was after intubation that there was a small drop in blood pressure. Yes. I think there's been a little bit of an aggressive fluid resuscitation in the initial phases. Okay, so I leave that. What about the other three uh, medication that are given, and what is your opinion about the three of them? Yes, sir. Tranexamic acid one gram was given as per the CRASH three trial in traumatic brain injury. Uh, uh, tranexamic acid one gram is justified, followed by in infusion, and levetiracetam uh, in a patient. What about the time interval? The tranexamic acid one gram over ten minutes, followed by no, no, uh, no, no. infusion one no, gram. Ask, no, I didn't ask that. Within first it, three hours. Within first three hours, this this, this patient fall within the first yes. three hours. Yeah, our time yes, of sir, admission was ten o'clock. Forty two. Ten o'clock. Forty. Forty was the accident. Okay. It was received around ten a.m. We hope that all of this was done before he was sent for the CT scan, right? Yes, sir. Uh, would you, Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, any head act, trauma actually sir uh, yeah the Go ct ahead. ct polytrauma still uh, the lesion was not confirmed on ct so immediately maybe after polytrauma the tranexamic acid is being given hmm. you know the uh, mechanism sir. why why would that be logical as for the crash 3 trial uh, the tranexamic acid is for the crash 3 trial i know that it is crash 3 trial but yes. what is the mechanism for that do you know 
to have chances of uh, reducing further expansion of the hematoma size. Antifibrinolytic agent? Yes. Okay, antifibrinolytic. That means it is prothrombotic. Okay. Then the initial phases, yeah, they do give it. That's perfectly fine. I, I have no problem about that. What about the other two? The levetiracetam, uh, actually as per recommendation, uh, either it is phenytoin or sodium valproate. Levipil as such does not have any proven recommendation or benefits over the other two, uh, except for side effect profile. Uh, the recommended thing Which is phenytoin or valproate that is to be given to avoid the early seizure in the first seven days. Okay. Is that for everybody? Anybody with a head injury? This guy's GCS was about 11 or so, if GCS I remember right. 10 or less. In Yes, sir. His GCS, was higher, than in his GCS was, was higher than that. His GCS was higher than that. And the fact was he was intubated mainly for his airway-related uh, problems, right? Issue. Okay. So do you think that that was also appropriate? I, I don't know. Again, lev levitracetam is considered as an alternative with no hard data to support it. Yes. Penitoin, as you said, is the only thing that is very effective in pre preventing early seizures. Does it make any difference in outcome? No, sir. Actually, no, as none. Per... Okay. none that we know of. Okay. So these three, I'm not too worried. Okay. All three of them, maybe I would debate the fluid. Maybe I would uh, debate the levy pill. Okay. Probably would have gone with phenytoin or maybe even not considering that the extent of injury. What What are the risk factors for, uh, for seizures after uh, head trauma? Do you know? Yes, sir. GCS of less than 10 or 10 or a patient is having depressed skull fracture or is having a EDS, EDH, SDH, uh, or uh, uh, deep conditions. Plus, if he has a seizure at that point of time or amnesia. If he's had a seizure, then it is not prophylaxis. Yes. If he's had a seizure, it is not prophylaxis. Yes. But for prophylaxis, what about penetrating injuries? We don't see them. Okay. Bullet injuries are probably a very significantly greater risk. This is a relatively soft indication. Okay. But anyway, I would not deny him that. Okay. I give it. Uh, also remembering that phenytoin has to be bolus dosed. It's got a lot of fever associated problems, so I'll skip it. I'm not going to worry about all of that. There is one more drug that has been administered over there. Ceftriaxone. Uh, actually, uh, the patient uh, uh, he sustained injuries in the car itself. Uh, it was prophylactically given, but there is no role what of prophylaxis of what? Prophylaxis what of the surgeon want? or prophylaxis of the patient? Prophylaxis of the patient. Actually, there Most was typically uh, the surgeon not that those. Is there an indication? You, you tell wound. me. Only if it was indication? a dirty wound, I would have given, but uh, the patient dirty just wound. came into this. Only Did he in have the an car. Open wound at all? He didn't have an open wound at all, right? Yes, sir. Except okay. for laceration, nothing missed. He had sinus fractures. Will that make a difference? A base of skull fracture? Yes, a base of skull fractures. Uh, they Does that are make an indication? Many... Yes, a base of skull fractures are prone for meningitis. So... No, no, I'm asking you, will that make it an indication for, for administering septrioxone? Yes. No. Again, I'm going to be very clear. Okay. The tendency almost what we should do, and I hope there are no surgeons listening in on this lecture. Okay. We should ban surgeons from giving antibiotics in the first place. Because very often, there is absolutely no indication for this patient to receive anything. You do un understand, if it is an open fracture, uh, I uh, completely agree. But there again, the selection of ceftrioxone. What is ceftrioxone? What generation cephalosporin is it? Again, the second generation cephalosporin. No, 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 no. Ceftrioxone. Third generation cephalosporin. Yeah, it's a useless third generation. Not even a great third generation choice, but it has a very specific value in the management of meningitis. There's no question about it. Maybe if you want to also keep it for your management of your typhoid and things like that, but you'd like to reserve it where you can be very effective. Is it going to be effective for any open wound in the skull? Yes, sir. Open wound is secondary. Ceftrioxone will be effective. gram positive coverage. Gram-positive coverage. Does the septrioxone have a gram-positive coverage? No, no, coverage? sir. Better to so have a gram-positive coverage. What will be your preference? Sir, if or vancomycin. 
Yeah, vancomycin is overkill again. So cefazolin seems a very reasonable thing to use, okay? Uh, but I think we need, we can't forgive our ER for all of this, okay? So I would agree that they gave the Tranexa early enough, three, three gram in whatever you have, the one gram stat, and then is there a value for a continued infusion? I'm not very sure. The Gansham probably tell me whether it's right or wrong. Levipil, I would on the borderline, but agree because the data on seizure prophylaxis with phenytoin is the best. With anything else, it is not very clear. Valproate is worse than phenytoin. And definitely um, the, the claim of, of Levipil comes from small studies. It's really weak data. Ceftrioxone is not indicated. And the fluid is probably excessively aggressive. So I think we need to be focusing on all those issues. Okay, so you got all your surgeons and everybody else involved in this. Okay, go ahead. I just want to ask one question. Sure, like, sure. Uh, with, res with, with respect to fluids, uh, what, was, what, what, what would be your hemodynamic target at this point of time? Or what would you be targeting if you're thinking of fluid? And what exactly would be there in your mind? His blood pressure was 100, isn't it? Yes, sir. So what exactly would you be targeting and why? Uh, his heart rate and respiration uh, was normal, sir. So I would look for an uh, increase in systolic BP and maintain a map of 70 millimeters of mercury. Also, I would uh, simultaneously catheterize the patient to look for a good urine output of at least 0.5 ml per kg per hour. Why a map of 70? Uh, in traumatic brain injury, again, to maintain an adequate uh, cerebral perfusion pressure. Sir, in uh, traumatic brain injury, the target mean uh, target systolic blood pressure is uh, one ten or hundred. If it is uh, fifteen to forty nine, it is hundred, and above seven, uh, so sixteen to sixty nine, above seventy or less than fifteen, it should be one ten. So Why are you worried about the hypotension here? I mean, hundred is not hypotension, isn't it? Because the cerebral for a young twenty five year old, yeah, to maintain the cerebral perfusion. Okay. And the first 24 hours is very critical. So hypotension is an independent predictor of mortality. So okay. if patient is having hypotension or hypoxemia, the mortality doubles. So we okay. need to aggressively nice. prevent the hypotension. Yeah, okay. Agree. There are yeah. issues related to secondary brain injury that you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. But okay. neither of it, neither the hypotension nor the hypoxia was significant enough for you to warrant such an aggressive kind of a management. Okay, anyway. That's a, a soft uh, position that you're taking. I think there's a little too much in terms of the fluid. Do you agree, Ganjam, or do you feel like... Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree, sir. I mean, too much of fluid because, again, uh, yeah. you know, 800 ml per hour, you might end up fluid overloading the patient or if he has subsequently developed some kind of a lung injury, then you're going to have problems in uh, achieving your ventilatory goals, which will, you know, on the other hand, again, will uh, complicate your secondary brain injury. Yes, absolutely. Do worry about the fact that, uh, yeah, about lung injury uh, as occurring in, in parallel to the head injury. Please understand that. that the lung is, I always was told if you got a chest x ray in an intubated patient and you don't have any lung pathology, they must have a neuro problem. It need not necessarily be very valid. Neuro problems are associated very often with lung changes, lung. whether it is the cardiogenic or non cardiogenic pulmonary edema or acute lung injury, uh, you know, uh, can be a very significant concern. Uh, and trying to overuse the fluid is something that we'd like to restrain ourselves from. I think you probably realize that what you're doing in critical care nowadays is easing off your fluids very significantly. Okay, go ahead. Hey, hey, before you go, before you go, uh, go, back, go back to the previous slide before, I, I'm sorry. Uh, on, on the previous slide, it doesn't matter even if you don't go. Any, anything missing? Investigations. No, that may come a little later. The, the emergency treatment that they do. Sedation. They would have sedated for the intubation. You did a you did a rapid sequence intubation, which means they did probably induce appropriately and probably a reasonable amount of sedation was there. And maybe that is also the reason for the mild hypotension that the patient had in the absence of anything else. Okay, that's acceptable. Anything else missing in that? Tetanus toxin. Pardon me? A TT injection. ET, don't worry about it. Actually, right now, I don't think, I think most of us will have a degree of immunity, okay? When is the last time you saw tetanus? I remember seeing it in my medical college uh, when we had a tetanus ward, but uh, short of that, I think even there, they closed the tetanus ward. Uh, I, I don't think there, there is anything else, okay? Um, you did? 
Okay, somebody asked, did you secure the spine? Fine. Yeah. Yes, sir. I did mention in the first slide. You did talk about inline stabilization. Yes. But after the inline yes. stabilization and the intubation, what else did you do? Would you put a hard collar on this patient? Uh, because you, there, you've not told me anything about doing a cervical spine evaluation and a guy with a head injury already. Yes, you showed me the CT of his head, but you didn't tell me anything about the associated cervical spine. Did you do a C-spine evaluation also at the same time? Yes, sir. Uh, detailed uh, CT polytrauma uh, okay. uh, is the protocol. So I'll have to make a presumption that when you... Okay. Yes. So I'm making a presumption that if you didn't say anything, that it was fine. Not acceptable. Even in the exam, okay, I would strongly suggest that you would say that you evaluated the CT of the spine, okay, appropriately. Uh, is the CT absolutely essential? Uh, I, I, probably I would consider a CT would be a minimum that you need to have evaluated and should be read by your radiologist or a neuroradiologist preferably before you start easing up on the spine. But in the meantime, okay, considering the acuteness of this, I think cervical spine, probably even putting in a hard collar at the short term, would probably be a very logical thing to do. There's no urgency about you to do uh, to jump to anything else. But besides that, that was somebody else's point that was raised. Uh, I can look through the chat box to see if there's anything else. Uh, they and said soft cervical collar. I don't no, agree no, with no. soft cervical yeah, collar. Yeah. Okay, I probably consider a hard collar. Uh, tetanus maintains CPP. Okay, all this has been answered. Uh, but effectively. Uh, I personally feel there was something else that was also missed besides the this. patient had a hypotension cell, so we need to look for other potential injuries. Yeah. The e first should be again. It is your definition of hypotension, right? He came in with normal looking, no average blood pressures, which uh, actually dropped when he gave him a little sedation and got a little bit better when he gave him a little bit of fluid. Whether you needed to give one liter or not, I'm not sure. Probably gone with smaller boluses, and you probably would have had a BP the one 120 by 60 that you're achieving over there would have been very fine. Okay. Yes, I do agree. Your point is well taken that if you have associated hypotension in somebody with a primary head injury, definitely look for alternate sources. Okay. I think we already did a secondary survey that was reasonably adequate. I hope the secondary survey included an EFAST, right? Do you I do think... it routinely? Yes, sir. We do. Yeah, I think so. Most of us get through the point where we do it on a routine basis. Okay, so it should have been done. And basically, you ruled out any other major injury, no long bone injuries that you saw. That's perfectly fine. Anything else that you missed? I'm still, I'm not going to let you go unless you get that one word uh, out of your mouth right now. And maybe I'm being a little too aggressive. Okay, what did the CT show you besides the subdural hemorrhage and minor contusions? There was evidence of, look at that uh, CT. Okay, I don't know whether this quality of the print or what. Do you see any sulcal spaces at all? I know, sir. No, so I just took a screenshot of one image. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, I, it would be nice if you just put the CT in there. It would have been nicer for us to be able to evaluate it, to know what the extent of the other contusions were, you know. So... Yes. What else would you have considered? That's the, I, now it's coming out. I've, I've already asked you the question. I've given you a leading question there. Any uh, signs of impending coning? So do we have to give anything yeah. as a rescue I'm measure? I'm asking you the question. You're not asking yes. me the question. Okay. So I measures. ask you the question. You tell me Ant what you want to do. Anti-edema measures. Please do that, no? Okay. Yeah, you have, recognizing, you have number one, recognizing very clearly that the CT itself is not a great indicator. When you see a patient with this degree of significant edema, if you say that you did not include concerns about anti-edema measures early, I would find it very difficult. I shouldn't be poking you to, to find this answer. Okay. So in the emergency treatment, the jump to give ceftrioxone seemed to have preceded the need for uh, anti-edema measures. Okay, so my own suggestion, and I, th I think you got some data a little later. I've seen your slides before. Okay, but would you have initiated therapy, or would you have attempted to do something else to confirm your own uh, your your uh, concerns? Sir, uh, this patient yeah. he had a GCS of ten. Ten at the time. And yes. 
Yes, but sir. then you sedated him and knocked him out. You don't know what it progressed to, right? Yes, and just just want to add. Just want to add one point, sure. sir. In the clinical examination, you have also mentioned pupillary asymmetry. Yes. Yeah, you have, you have mentioned yeah. pupillary asymmetry, but you're not well compatible with some changes. But at the same time, that that raises my concern, doesn't it? The pupillary asymmetry, the cerebral edema that you're seeing on the CT, the la moderately large uh, subdural that you have along with the midline shift. Okay, raises the concern that this patient will probably need anti edema measures. Okay, which brings me to my favorite question that I will ask in every exam. exam. Okay, what is your choice of an anti edema measure? Uh, Maritol or 3% initial, they do not have any extra edge over each other, but I would be a little. Uh, Cautious if the patient is hypotensive or uh, deranged uh, kidney function, I would not use Maritol. And I don't know about the kidney function yet. Okay. So if uh, the patient is know... hypotensive, I would avoid using Maritol, sir, in a hypoten already hypotensive patient. See, no, I don't care about the general approach. In this particular patient, what would your choice be? Right now, he's got a BP of 118 by 70, which for a young guy seems to be appropriate, especially after he's been sedated and put on a ventilator. Okay seems reasonably appropriate. What would your choice be? Your choice? Sir, I will go with hypertonic salary, 3% salary as a bolus. Okay, how much? 3% salary in 150 ml bolus. Okay, nobody even knows, quite, quite honestly. You can give anything that you want, okay? But why, why not uh, pick on mannitol? Can I ask you that question? Yes, sir, a mannitol can cause a rebound uh, raising ICP. Why this one won't, is it? If you stop the 3%, theoretically it not. Theoretically so won't cause. Yeah, but is it more effective? No data. Again, everything neurosurgery is doing is without data. Okay. So my own question will be straightforward. All right. To me, if I was to give an, a, a situation where both mannitol and 3% were acceptable, okay, I'll ask you, uh, what would your choice be? If there was no hypotension as a concern, no renal dysfunction as a concern in a patient acutely, okay, we don't have a high enough concentrated 3%, more than 3% over here for us to give the sodium. Even if you give about 300 ml, you probably raise the osmolarity by what, uh, what, 5 milli uh, millicoulombs times 2, roughly about 10 milli osmos or something, you'll raise it by. You won't be re really very good in terms of raising your osmolarity, right? So what would your choice be? Why not use Manitol? I'm just being the pain in the neck examiner. This is the way they are. Okay. Yeah, right now, you don't have to worry. So, so what I is just, your, How is your sir, preference? Sir, just, just want to add one more thing. Just want to add yeah, one more to. thing. Considering yeah. the pupillary asymmetry, asymmetry, why not a little hyperventilation here? Why not? Hey, we'll keep that there. Okay, we'll keep that question uh, next one. Okay, yeah, but okay. we'll start with we'll start with this. We'll start with the, the entire thing. I want everybody to be very clear on mannitol versus three percent. Okay, I'll ask you a simple question: If you need to give mannitol, can you give it as an infusion or give it as an eighth hourly dose or something like that? No, sir, not recommended. We have to only give boluses. No fixed boluses. Yeah, go ahead. Boluses. Only boluses. boluses? And how, what do you what do you titrate it to? Uh, so serum osmolarity, three twenty is the target. Osmolarity, yes. Uh, so what will it do to your uh, ICP? It will basically normal brain will be dehydrated, so that will momentarily reduce the ICP mm -hmm. as a rescue okay. measure. The reason I brought this in is very very clearly that mannitol doesn't work in acute rises in ICP because of its osmolarity related dehydration. It works because of its rheological effects. When you give mannitol as a bolus, okay, you acutely cause a better perfusion, reduced viscosity, more brain oxygenation. And if your cerebral vessels are autoregulation is intact, it will cause vasoconstriction, which will reduce the ICP almost instantaneously. Okay, So the way in which mannitol works is by bolusing it, First, the volume, second, the osmolarity, okay, uh, will definitely, not the osmolarity, the viscosity will definitely make a difference in the perfusion and will cause an immediate drop in ICP if the autoregulation is normal. 
The only way in which you can know that mannitol is going to be effective is if you can measure the intracranial pressure and demonstrate a decline in intracranial pressure with this. If the autoregulation is lost, mannitol will do nothing. Okay, mannitol doesn't work only by its late action. Mannitol works instantly and it works instantly <coughs> in patients with preserved autoregulation, which in a traumatic brain injury can be very variable. Okay, I think we need to understand that mechanism very, very clearly. So mannitol, if you're going to give, that is one aspect of it. The second, you said you need to maintain a serum osmolarity of less than how much? 320. 300 to 320. Okay. How do you measure the serum osmolarity? Sir, we can calculate it or uh, we'll get it from the labs. So what the lab need... will also calculate it only. If you get it from the lab, they'll calculate it. Yes, sir, but we need to calculate including the mannitol. So that calculated osmolarity won't be enough. No, you can't count it at all. Just remember that in your lab, do you have a way of measuring the osmolarity yeah. rather than calculating the osmolarity? Very important. Please check your lab before you use it, right? Especially with mannitol, because you need to measure your osmolarity and you can't use your, your sodium times 2 plus BUN uh, and uh, glucose calculation that you typically would use. Right? Yes, so sir. your measured osmolarity, how do you measure osmolarity? Can I ask you that? My favorite question, that's why. Okay, I'm here only to uh, enjoy myself now and to, to harass you. Okay. What is it? It is called a freezing point osmometer. Okay, you would know this if you were in, uh, in a Western country where they will throw salt on the ice every time it snows. What does the salt do when you add it to the ice? It uh, melts the ice. It lowers the freezing point. And because it lowers the freezing point, the ice that is on the road will melt. All right. And you use the same principle for calculating osmolarity. It's the osmolarity of the salt that causes the freezing point to be depressed. And if you have a method of measuring a depression in the freezing point, it can be done. There are freezing point osmometers available. I know, for instance, in some of our institutes, particularly some, I think in one of our pediatric hospitals, they do have a measurement. If you're going to be using mannitol, safety requires that you have the ability to measure osmolarity, which 99% of Indian hospitals doesn't exist. Okay, so for the two reasons. Osmo, the effect of osmo, uh, mannitol will be only if you give it as a bolus and you demonstrate a reduction in ICP. Okay. The second aspect is its safety will be completely dictated by the fact that you have to measure your osmolarity. If you can't do both of that, 3% saline has an upper hand. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. And your, your choice of 3% probably springs from that. Now, I'll ask you another question. Okay. Would you give 3% to all patients, or would you give it only to selective patients with like this, where you suspect that the ICP is high? It's only for selected patients. So there is no recommendation for routine use of hypertonic saline to prevent trace in ICP. Uh, on the basis of? Brain Trauma Foundation gives. The Brain Trauma Foundation gives its guidelines once every three centuries. Okay, so they don't have current information. Uh, last month or a couple of months ago, there was a trial called the COBI trial, C-O-B-I, okay, that, that focused on the routine use of 20% saline, okay, not even 3% saline in patients with a mild and moderate, okay, mild, not mild, moderate and severe head injury. And what was very interesting is they gave it to everybody across the board. And what they saw was, though there was no improvement in neurological outcome, that's what they were looking at. They were not looking at mortality or anything of that sort. No improvement in neurological outcome. The number of events that were associated with an elevated ICP was reduced when you used the 3%. And it actually rebounded when you stopped the 3 the 20%. Okay, it did rebound. So there is a concern about rebound also under these circumstances. And there is a, a reasonable in, indication that it will reduce it. So in this patient, if you were considering to give the 3% as your choice and not man at all, would you have done anything else? One more thing that you would have done. What else would you have done? You said you won't give it to everybody across the board. And the COBE trial says don't give it to everybody across ICP the board. ICP monitoring. What ICP monitoring will you do? 
non I'm asking you a question. Do you do it in your hospital? Do you yes, do sir. it? Yes, sir. R routinely for all your head traumas with the GCS. No, no, not level. routinely, sir. Uh, we'll do it GCS of 11. Uh, and this particular patient, would you consider putting in an ICP, IC, uh, ICP monitor? No, sir. GCS of Why, what, what will be the reasons? Oh, yeah, no, go sir, ahead. GCS less than less eight. Than eight. Uh, with an abnormal CT is an indication for uh, ICP monitoring. Otherwise, uh -huh. with GCS of less than 8, with a normal CT brain, in case either if he has two of it, like uh, age more than 40 years, yes. or yes. Uh, systolic BP less than 100. Good. Yes. Good. You, you, you read the textbook very nicely, and I completely agree with yes. your indications. Completely right. Okay? He doesn't fit into that. But even if he did fit into it, what is your choice of ICP monitors that you can use under these circumstances? Non-invasive methods like uh, ONSD. Okay. Yeah, or... why not ONSD? So did you not measure it? Remember that the CT itself is a very poor indicator of the extent of ICP rise. It may show you cerebral edema, it will show you all the other features, but it doesn't correlate very well with a rise in ICP. So I think you need at least an ONSD. Are you familiar with the ONSD, I suppose, obviously. So later in your presentation, I think you mentioned it, but I would have done that. So the two things that I would have worked on definitely in the early phases is I would have put my ultrasound onto the eyeball, check the ONSD in the face of these kinds of parameters and gone ahead with anti-edema measures with a preference to 3% under our circumstances. And uh, very, very clearly, the fact that I can't measure uh, ICP or other things. Okay, I'm going to use 3%. Okay, and how do I give it? Again, it's a guess, guessing game. I probably would start an initial bolus a couple of times, uh, see if the sodium is rising, put them on uh, a continuous infusion of some kind. But uh, just remember, uh, that will be the one option that we need to have considered. I think we have gone a little too much uh, into that. Can you go back into your slides back where you were? Go ahead. Gantam, do you have anything else to add? I'm sorry, I always have... No, no, no. Dominate. I dominate. No, no, no. Absolutely no. Okay. All right. All right. So go go ahead. I mean, I see not... hey, you forgot Gantam's question at this point in time. Would you have hyperventilated that patient? No, sir. Not within uh, the 24 hours. The patient in the initial first 24 hours is associated with high mortality. And unless the ENLS guidelines, they say unless there is like acute uh, signs of uh, herniation, you need not uh, hyperventilate the patient. There is no recommendation for hyperventilation. You can consider it if you're going to take in for emergent surgery or for any kind of decompression at that point in time. Okay. Otherwise, I think play it safe and don't hyperventilate. What are you doing over here? What did your blood gas show you? Uh, this is the blood gas that I have uh, in the day two. Mm -hmm presentation. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the patient continued to be on ventilator. The ABG showed good oxygenation and uh, CO2 of around 44.5 millimeters mercury. Uh, he was maintaining vitals uh, with pulse of 60 per minute, BP of 114 over 62 millimeters mercury, good saturation of 100 and was breathing at 18 per minute and urine output was adequate. The GCS on day two was was even VT and M5. The pupils were still unequal, uh, the left being uh, 3mm and the right being 2mm, both reacting to light. Uh, after 24 hours, the CT brain was re uh, repeated, which didn't show any increase in midline shift or increase in the bleed or a new uh, expansion in the hematoma. The labs recorded on the day two were all within normal range. ONST, which was being recorded, uh, also showed an average of 0.55 centimeters. Uh, so we are continuing with sir. 0.55. Yes, sir. Is uh, that la, la, big or small? That is, again, 0.5 and above correlates with the uh, ICP greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. Yeah. So this is, again, a suggestion. Again, you have not mentioned anything about your osmolar therapy, right? Yes, sir. Okay. We, I think that was a big flaw from the beginning. Uh, the management of osmolarity was not done appropriately. Fine, perfectly fine. Okay, so, uh, so the, the ONSD, patient... can I ask you something about the ONSD? Yes. Is it a good indicator that does it have, does it track your ICP very well? So if I gave somebody had a, a ONSD of 0.55 right now, I put them on 3% saline, 
had their osmolarity go up sufficiently, will it definitely bring down your ONST rapidly? Uh, it takes around five to ten minutes per onset of action, and the action remains. Uh, action? Uh, what forever. action? I didn't understand. What action? I didn't understand. Sir, uh, serial measurement of ONST, we can consider uh, whether the treatment that we are giving is adequate or if it is responding. And the worsening of ONST can be considered as a sign of price rising. Yeah, I, I, I'm not very sure about it. There is at least one very small trial of people who had lumbar punctures for reduction of their intracranial pressures, okay? Where they've shown that the ONST may track it. Okay, but I'm very concerned that more often than not, it probably will not be a great tracker of the changes that are occurring. Okay, so while ONSD will say it is greater than 20 or less than 20, it probably will not be very difficult. Somebody asked me, what if it is associated with eye injuries? Is the ONSD reliable? I honestly don't know the answer. So I'm going to bluff if you can't ask me that question. Does anybody know? One of you know? Somebody is asking about that. Ancham, do you know? No, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't try to do it if you have yeah. a glass I, eye I, injury. I, 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 I wouldn't, wouldn't put the more. probe on them. Exactly. If you had significant eye injury, nobody is probably even going to put the eyeball probe on. Okay. Uh, remember, there are lots of limitations. ONST is not as easy as people say. I can find huge amounts of variability between individuals. Okay. Though I, 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 my former colleague, I think uh, Venkata, Venkata Krishna Rajaji has written a large paper on that, a meta-analysis of ONSD, and they claim that it has got excellent uh, you know, prediction for high elevated ICP. They don't talk anything about tracking, and they don't talk about the inter-observer inter variability. For me, it is very difficult. Okay, What you do has to be very careful. You have to do that three millimeters behind the the point uh, where you need to do it, measure it truly across, you will have crossing over of the muscle uh, fibers. You can have a lot of artifact that will actually create. Yeah, somebody says it's observer bias. Absolutely, that is what we call observer bias. It's a subjective kind of an index, okay? But something that I would be very careful, even a 0.55 is not something that I will jump at. I will say it's marginal, okay? But for me to justify my 3% saline, I will say I'll continue to use that because there is no justification for routine use of 3% saline. Okay, so that is very, very clear. Okay, go ahead, sorry. The patient uh, was being continued on 3% NSA infusion with sodium being monitored and he was uh, continued to be uh, sedated. On day three, again, the patient continued to be on ventilator required sedation because of irritability and he maintained adequate vitals. Uh, the GCS continued to be the same, E1, VT, M5. Uh, the labs also were within normal range. The ONST that was recorded in day three was around 0.5 centimeters. And sa same plan of treatment was continued on day three. It was continued to be. Pupils huh? became even, three millimeters yes, on both sides. Were equal. We were in touch with the ophthalmologist. Uh, so one cause of pupillary asymmetry we thought was because of maybe raised ICP or maybe some uh, pupillary sphincter injury uh, to the left eye. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Uh, so day four, uh, there was a plan for early percutaneous tracheostomy, which was done. His GCS was around E2 M5. He was hemodynamically stable. Continued the same, uh, day five to day seven. Uh, he, there was a plan to wean and he was being weaned on the ventilator. Can I supply. stop you over here? Yes, Can sir. I stop you over yes, here? Yes. All right. Okay. Day four, the patient was mildly agitated, was showing you all signs of recovery, didn't have a major enough uh, a, um, bleed that he needed any kind of intervention. Okay. You uh, went ahead and did a percutaneous tracheostomy, right? Indicated, unindicated, appropriate, inappropriate. Early tracheostomy as such, uh, there is no recommendation, but they say it is level 2A in the Brain Trauma find, uh, Foundation just to reduce the day of ventilator analysis or sedation requirement. As such, no mortality benefit. The patient continued to be irritable, so it was based on the clinical call along with the neurosurgeon who wanted an early oh, How familiar are you with the data related to early tracheostomy versus delayed tracheostomy? 
Okay, it won't be in neurosurgical patients very typically because there are no large enough studies on neurosurgical patients, but we can extrapolate it from other patients in the ICU. So, yeah, go ahead. Trackman trial is one where early trichostomy versus uh, the late after 10 days didn't show any mortality benefit though, but the yeah. ICU stay and the sedation analysis requirement and the vent ventilator free days were better. No, not in the TRACMAN trial. In the TRACMAN trial, nothing was better, including the duration of survival. Okay, there is another well, uh, parallel study, that Italian study, I don't know, Terra, Terra Genia, who, whoever it was, effectively you showed that while you don't have a mortality difference, nor a change in pneumonia rates, that venability, uh, getting off the ventilator, all of that is better. Okay, so if you really look at meta-analysis, they will always say, that if you do an early tracheostomy, even if you don't cause an improvement in survival, you probably will allow quicker mobilization of the ventilator and transfer out of the ICU. All right. Is there an adverse effect to it, to doing a tracheostomy? If you do an early tracheostomy or plan an early tracheostomy, okay, is there a tendency for you to do more tracheostomies than you should be doing? Serious question, because this guy doesn't look like he had an indication. If you gave him two more days, you'd probably come off without a tracheostomy scar. Am I right? It's a possibility. And that's exactly what the track man also shows in the early group. And there, again, it's not four days. It's, I think, seven days or a little longer. Seven or ten days is the, is the duration. If you did an early tracheostomy, the tendency for patients assigned to an early tracheostomy to almost inevitably get a tracheostomy. But when you delay the tracheostomy randomly, only about half the patients will ultimately require a tracheostomy. So what you're doing over here is you're getting a lot more patients giving a tracheostomy, okay, when they don't need it. Does it have any adverse consequences? I'll ask a question that is very important for you to know. Is a tracheostomy benign? Is it associated with any differences in outcome? No, because we need to seriously, this is the kind of thing, as a percutaneous tracheostomy, you as the intensivist would have done it, right? You would have been the one who coaxed the uh, neurosurgeon to go ahead and get it done. So you have done it. You need to know whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. All right. So one other quick question that I will ask you in terms of outcome, okay? Does a tracheostomy affect outcome? No, sir. Here, no, sir. no it doesn't, huh? I would say, I would argue that it actually makes a negative impact on outcome. Is there anything to support me? Yes, and absolutely. Uh, closure. It's not, huh? Yeah, go ahead. Closure of the tracheostomy and all will require long. No, no, no. Uh, that may be minor, but I'm just saying there is going to be an effect on, on outcome in patients who get a tracheostomy and get transferred out of the ICU. Okay, I'll ask you, in your own institution, when you transfer a patient with a tracheostomy outside the ICU, how often do they rebound to you? They do rebound with a block. With a block, because and sometimes that block can be lethal, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It can be associated with an RS. There is data to support that. It is not from randomized controlled trials. But there are trials that show you, not that is actually a propensity analysis that clearly shows you that in large observational cohorts, when a patient gets a tracheostomy and you decannulate them within the ICU, there is no difference in survival. Okay, But if you leave the tracheostomy and you send them out of the ICU, that is the primary intent, right? You're going to mobilize them very quickly. That's what you wanted to do. Okay, It is associated with an excess mortality. Okay. I would want you to be very aware of that also. Okay, so I think that this was something that struck me. Besides your anti-edema measures, this struck me very, very prominently that you're giving far too early a tracheostomy on this patient. Okay, all right. So what is your preferred way of doing that uh, uh, percutaneous tracheostomy quickly? Because I don't think there's too much else to be discussing right now. Is there anything else, Kansham? Uh, we can... We can... I think one of the reasons why they have done an early tracheostomy because he also has a diffuse adrenal component. 
Right. The initial uh, uh, CT is they have reported a grade two diffuse axonal component. So not from the subdural point of view, but probably from the diffuse axonal maybe. Yeah, but I, I still think it is completely acceptable when four days is very prematurely early, isn't it? If you say yeah. early yeah. tracheostomy, I don't mind. If you wait for seven to 10 days, I don't mind it. Okay. If you're going to do it on fourth day, you're likely to end up with a large number of tracheostomies. <coughs> Okay, and I don't know whether it is less expensive, especially uh, if there is going to be a potential for adverse events. I got a, the message saying, if you train your people to, to provide care outside the ICU, it can be very effective. There is no question about it, okay? We need to have a standardized protocol. One of the reasons that we need to have a standardized protocol for continued care of a tracheostomized patient is the fact that these kinds of complications do impact the patient's outcome. So that is something that we should be reasonably aware of, okay? Uh, do you have any standard protocol for the management of your patients after they leave the ICU? Patients as such uh, is shifted to the rehab center, which we have it in our, next to our own ICU. Now, so who, who provides the care for the tracheostomy after that? We have trained sisters and uh, the, uh, the respiratory therapist who go and take hmm. care regular basis about I personally system. think that that is not enough okay the respiratory therapists and sisters can help they can be definitely very beneficial but there is also a need for a, a well it doesn't matter I don't know whether I'm being a little too uh, insistent on a doctor but if you have a standardized protocol it is very necessary because I know for a fact in our hospital they get lost you know, what will happen is if a percutaneous tracheostomy is done, the ENT say, uh, we won't take care. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, some of us are blocked from going out to the periphery. Okay. Uh, there's a little bit of a turf war. It creates a problem. But this is a well-known, this is not a documented outcome only in India. This is a well-known term of a, of a tracheostomy done in the ICU. Please be very clear. All these are logical. You can have uh, outreach uh, training of your nurses, you can do all those kinds of things, but it's not necessary, okay, that uh, uh, when you can avoid a tracheostomy, I feel that there is a need for you to avoid it, okay? All right, so go ahead. Anything else that comes out of your... Go ahead. Anything else that you have? Again, day no, eight. That's not... So what you saw in day eight was a reasonably straightforward thing. This basically guy got better, Okay, so if you had waited till day eight, it will prove my point. You may have extubated him without a problem. Right. Okay, okay. Will this pay a patient be a high risk for post uh, extubation complications? So I didn't get you. So if 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 you say that you didn't do a tracheostomy, and it took till the eighth day for him to come off the ventilator, okay, would he be a risk for post extubation? immediate complications in any way. What will be the concerns that you usually worry about in terms of the airway? Eighth day of extubation. No, there was no significant airway injury as such. The reason he for intubation. But he had an endotracheal tube for eight days. Yes, uh, chances of airway edema. Yeah. Airway edema, VAP. VAP. VAP, I'm not, I mean, yeah, VAP is an independent process, but airway edema is my concern, no? And when we're talking about it, we're talking about classically either subglottic edema of some kind can occur, all right? So is he a risk factor? That's all the question that I'm asking. No, sir. See, since we are already ending, I, I just wanted to prolong this a little bit more and try to see if I can throw other questions that need not necessarily be directed at neurosurgery alone, but basically in the developing of this case, okay? So, no. is there a concern that this guy could have developed an airway edema? The fluid resuscitation that was only given in the initial part. Okay. That's one respect. Is that, a, is that an association with airway edema? What is the strongest association with airway edema besides the length of intubation? Am I waiting for too long? Somebody says TBI patient agitated. Yeah. Somebody says cough. And the third person said well, female, the gender. female gender. Is that a very strong association? Absolutely. 
okay? If I had a woman that was intubated for eight days and I wanted to extubate that patient, I can almost be certain that is a one in three chance of them developing glottic edema, okay? Sub subglottic edema and having enough respiratory distress to probably either warrant non-invasive support or probably even reintubation under those circumstances. For men in general, it doesn't seem like it is that frequent. Why is there a difference in the gender? The size of the glottis. Size of the larynx in general, yes. yes. Size of the larynx. Because injury is extremely common. Even if you leave an endotracheal tube in place for 24 to 48 hours, and there's been nice studies that looked at routine ENT evaluation after you take out the tube, the frequency of, of uh, laryngeal injury is quite high, but it doesn't compromise the airway in, in people with larger larynxes, which is also very important. In pediatrics, if you deal, deal with it, is glottic edema very common? Yes, sir. Yes. Again, for the same reasons, because injury is probably similar in terms of the rate, but the consequences of the injury is dependent on the size of the, of the larynx effectively. Yes. So in women and in pediatrics, you do worry about the higher rate of, of this. Okay, so what are the steps that you can take? So if this guy came on to the eighth day, completely awake and, and relatively well, you feel that his intubation is a little on the longer side. Okay, and you want to take out the tube. And I told you he doesn't have, no, he's not female gender, so risk is rel relatively better. Okay, so as a consequence, what, what will be the things that I need to do to make sure that he doesn't have a problem? We can do a cuff leak test. You're familiar to... with the cuff leak test? Okay. Yes, sir. How do you do the cuff leak test? Sir, we will connect it to the patient to the ventilator in a control yes. mode of mechanical ventilation. And we will. Uh, what control mode? Pressure volume control, control, volume control. control ventilation. I hope so. Yes, sir. Standard tidal volume? Standard tidal volume. Uh, tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml per kg. No. Nobody even knows. Okay, you'll see a lot of variation. It, you will see other people saying 500 ml as a, as a as a minimum tidal volume. And what will be the, the amount of leak that will be anticipated? It should be a large leak if there is no glottic edema, right? Yes. So if the if the leak is less than less than hundred, either given as a percentage or as less than 150 ml, okay, 150 ml or 120 ml that you would use is usually the way in which they define it. That is the whole problem about the cuff leak test. If you look at different uh, studies, the definitions are extremely variable. And the heterogeneity of this is so significant that its performance as a good test is very limited. Okay, So I would be very cautious about the cuff leak test. It's also a potentially decompensating kind of a test. The patient can end up with an acute aspiration and have problems associated with that. Okay. Uh, is there an alternative way in which you can handle it? So let's okay, let's just say the patient had a positive cuff leak test, that there was a certain amount of moderate edema and the leak was extremely small. Okay. So what would you do under those circumstances? Would you go ahead with your tracheostomy? So we can give a trial of steroids and wait for 24 hours and then okay, what try. will be that is also important. A trial of steroids, uh, dexamethasone. Dexamethasone. Is that your, which is your trial? trial the, dexamethasone. Right now we're all in a COVID mode. We know only dexamethasone, everybody doesn't know. We don't know anything else. Dexamethasone. Is that the recommended uh, dose? Okay. My memory is very clearly methylprednisolone. Okay. Given as one milligram per kg body weight initial dose. Okay. All right. Uh, and then followed by how many doses do you give? Is it one dose or multiple doses? One dose and wait for 24 hours. No, absolutely not. A nice meta-analysis tells you that the benefit of steroid will be only if you give multiple doses. Okay? So it's usually given every fourth hourly. The way I do it is I'll start the previous evening, give three doses before the extubation, three or four doses before the extubation, every fourth hourly, and then extubate them. There is definitely a concern that you will create a short-term hyperglycemia, but the associated benefit is with multiple doses, okay? So I think, hey, I didn't have anything else to talk about, so I just threw this in, okay? All right, uh, somebody suggests uh, NIV. Uh, is there any value to extubating this patient to NIV? 
sorry airway edema with niv if the patient develops airway edema i would consider as as a process of trying to minimize the hope that you will minimize the need for reintubation okay but uh, no patient, yeah. trauma traumatic brain injury patient i'll be a little careful about it especially, especially i'm extubating him a whole bunch of facial bone injuries and fractures yeah, everything yeah. else that he's got okay he may not be a candidate nor is there an indication from this this perspective okay so he will be somebody i would probably okay i would maybe do a cuff leak test i may be I, sometimes i'd be a little reluctant to do it if i saw a positive test in a male i definitely will seriously consider going ahead and giving the steroid in general in women considering the frequency and the indian data is not available the best data is we can extrapolate it from hong kong for instance asian women in general there is almost a one third um, uh, i mean one out of three will develop a significant enough airway edema that i will almost argue that if this was a woman on the eighth day for extubation i would have given multiple doses okay okay anything else that we have missed on management anybody else have any opinions uh, there are eight racemic epinephrine sir post extubation there may be racemic epinephrine inhaler nebulization yeah racemic epinephrine okay i see a lot of these questions a uh, lot of them are uh, confirming a lot of what we said everybody is very vehement that it's 110 ml for the leak i'd agree with that okay uh, because i don't remember the numbers um, the other aspect of it was uh, the issues related to how you manage this right uh, racemic epinephrine is there a need for racemic epinephrine or can you use just any epinephrine no sir we need racemic epinephrine not necessarily okay there is no no clear benefit one over the other okay do we have racemic uh, uh, epinephrine at all we don't have it routinely available i think okay uh, uh, racemic epinephrine okay i'm i'm just looking to some of these questions we'll come back to all of yeah. this okay um racemic is not necessarily what is the dosing that you would give of the epinephrine if you have a strider i think we're going completely off neurotrauma into completely well it's post op post extubation management that's completely acceptable 0.19 one ml one ml is one mg sir okay one. so how much will you give one mg is 1000 micrograms okay it is typically 500 to 50 to 500 micrograms a quarter or one ml which you put into your nebulizer with an appropriate amount of saline and nebulizer okay that is acceptable as your treatment so that is your treatment of choice okay there are a few questions that i was just looking at and let me let me just see what the yeah, these yes, questions sir. are okay about go ahead Concern anti seizure yeah there, there is some question on anti seizure prophylaxis and the duration if you are giving it for how long mm -hmm. would you give the uh, seizure prophylaxis sir uh, i won't answer it what do you how long will you give it I, i've gone into too much of a tirade myself no it's for you guys who presented the case to tell me how long you're given seizure prophylaxis is recommended to prevent the early post traumatic seizures for the first 7 days so continuing it beyond for long is not recommended as such completely acceptable But it is for the prophylaxis only 7 days sir but if there are seizures so we may have to continue till longer okay. that doesn't become seizure prophylaxis it becomes yes. seizure therapy okay therapy nobody is going to have a doubt about it no again and again this is one thing that you will see with virtually every form of neurological injury whether it is uh, from strokes to hemorrhages to subarachnoid bleed to uh, trauma whatever else the associated rates of seizures are significantly elevated with any virtually every one of them there is no question about it okay the rates are increased but the data for prophylaxis is very poor most of the studies will show you that prophylaxis under any of those circumstances is not associated with less injury and probably actually carries an excess risk of neurological um, adverse outcome okay so really prophylaxis is a tough choice so if you are going to use the prophylaxis you have to make sure that you are not going to extend it beyond that first week where it is alleged to be effective okay and that is important for one thing was there any other question uh, that you saw gancha uh so there was something about anti uh, dvt prophylaxis anti thrombotic anticoagulation ah, 
yeah why not ask about that anticoagulation as such uh, the recommendation is class 3 that to to start after 72 hours of the injury mechanical yeah. is uh, the part the mechanical first immediately score, after the after you can start 70. immediately with the mechanical right yes. but 72 hours is the recommendation for you to start with low molecular weight heparin later right yes. okay yeah, this guy again uh, with that large subdural and all of that i don't think that even with intracranial bleeds okay if the patient is reasonably stable and is improving there is probably no indication for you to worry about dbt uh, uh, related complex i mean bleeding related complications so usually 72 hours even in uh, intracerebral hemorrhage it's a hemorrhagic strokes i think after 72 hours it is recommended so they all stay the same way uh, somebody asked for dual antiplatelet okay. reinitiation why do we need to start this patient on dual antiplatelet he doesn't have cerebrovascular disease under these conditions there is probably no need for it um, routinely advisable for to give AED for every TB, TBI. What is AED? I don't know. Anti-epileptic. Anti-epileptic yeah, drugs for mild yeah. SH. Yeah. Not, not indicated. Yeah, yeah. We already talked about it to some extent, right? Yes. That the indications are at best very uh, obscure. Penetrating injuries, significant uh, traumatic bleeds, intraparenchymal bleeds, probably uh, will be a reasonable indication along with very severe head injury would be a good indication for you to go ahead. And there again, it's going to be that, that one week alone. Was there any other? Decompressive cranial decompressive cranial cranial. Cranial. Uh, The role of decompressive craniotomy, the clear uh, guidelines from ENLS and Brain Trauma Foundation. They say if uh, it is EDH, it has to be a volume of 30, 25 m, uh, 30 ml or more or with a midline shift of 5 ml or more. If it is SDH, it has to be 10... Uh, uh, mm or more thickness with a midline shift of 5 mm or, or any point of time with these if the patient has a GCS drop of uh, 2 or below from the baseline or uh, signs of formation okay. or uh, also for uh, the uh, I mean as such for depressed skull fractures also uh, there are, uh, for hemicraniectomy Okay, what is the data as far as hemicraniectomy is concerned? Decompressive hemicraniectomy in trauma? Two trials, major uh, trials. Yeah. Rescue ICP and DECRA. Teach you trials, remember those trials. Absolutely, very good. Okay, you're going for the exam, so you're good at uh, quoting it appropriately. Uh, Sir, but I get a pass and probably uh, You'll get a pass and probably a little bit higher, closer to a distinction on that. Okay, fine. Okay, so what are the outcomes? If you tell me the outcomes, I'll give you the prize. Sir, in DECRA, there was no outcome. Gas, uh, that extended gas to Glasgow outcome score was not improved in DECRA trial. But in rescue ICP trial, there was a uh, mortality benefit, but uh, there was a higher upper severe disability and a higher lower severe disability. So what are you trying to say? Okay, I didn't understand any of it. So the so, mortality was better, but the patient had more disability in six better. months. Survival, survival was better, and but the outcome it. in terms of gas, uh, uh, the patient's okay. physical outcome was worse in uh, early decompressive craniectomy. I think we need to express this very clearly. The decompressive hem hemicraniectomy will save a life. There is no question about it. Meta-analysis after these will probably point in the same direction that it will save a life. But the life will not be associated with an improved neurological outcome. There is going to be an excess of significant neurological disadvantage. Okay, you have a small benefit in terms of the lower scores, but a major shift in terms of the higher scores, and that is something that you should be very careful about. So, if you're going to offer it, it will also depend on on what the patient wants, what the family wants. Do they want them alive, or do they want them alive and functional? Okay, and in a younger individual, you probably would offer that alive as the first thing and say functionality can be something that you can achieve over a period of time. This is distinctly different from what you get with stroke. With major stroke, and you do hemicraniectomy studies as far as that is concerned, the outcome is also yeah. beneficial, not only the survival, but also in terms of good neurological outcome, there's a benefit. Okay, And there is a reduction in mortality and high uh, uh, scores. Okay, So I think we need to be very clear that there's a distinction between the two. So somebody asked about it. So this will be the approach. This patient obviously didn't need it. Okay. All right. 
So, okay. is there anything else, Gansham, that I'm missing? I can't read. There are too many questions. Yes, the, uh, there, there is somebody who asked, uh, how often would the serial CT scan can be done? Again, uh, this is a little comp complex. The, in this particular patient, because you sedated the patient, okay, you probably didn't have a method of reassessing the neurological status and you've done it. I don't know what the indications are. If there is a genuine deterioration in status, then probably there will be a valid reason. I don't know what the recommendations are for repeat CT scans. Okay. Our traditional approach would be to say, go ahead and do it if there's a deterioration. Anybody? What did you ATLS, say? ATLS says every to, after 12 hours, we need to repeat the CT scan if there is a moderate to severe brain injury right. or if there is a deterioration in GCS. Any point of deterioration in GCS is completely acceptable, but deterioration in GCS is often clouded by the fact that we use a lot of sedation on these patients. Okay, um, so that that is what probably one more reason why if you had an ICP monitor, you'll feel a lot more comfortable because if you can watch your trends and if you don't see a deterioration, you'll be quite comfortable. Okay, but there is really no hard data. I, I'm not very sure about. It. I'm going to be clear when people ask me a question that I don't know the answer to, I'm going to tell you that I don't know the answer to that. Okay. But I, I, I hope uh, the point that I wanted to make about mannitol is something that is very commonly misunderstood. You always think of it as an osmotic agent alone. It may have an osmotic purpose, but it has got a strong rheological acute reduction of ICP. You give it within minutes, there's a decline in ICP. It can't be because of osmolarity. Okay. So it is, I mean, can't be because it is absorbing the fluid. It is clearly because of the rheological properties. The same thing works even with the sensor line. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. It takes almost 30 minutes to one hour before the osmolarity starts working and the osmotic yeah. uh, drag of the fluid uh, no, occurs. Uh, acts for, it as maximize, a, for it to maximize, it takes several hours. But yeah, what you yeah. will see in terms of reduction in ICP will be instantaneous. It will be instantaneous. Okay. So that is something, which is why if you want to give mannitol, I'll give you the rules, okay? Guarantee that you have a measure of intracranial pressure other than the ONSD, an active measure of intracranial pressure. Give the mannitol only as boluses, and the boluses should be given with a follow-up on the intracranial pressure. There is no fixed dose of mannitol that you should be administering, not 6 hourly, not continuous infusion, not with Lasix, by the way. I forget about yeah. that, okay? You do not give it like that. But you give it whenever there is an elevation in the ICP that goes up to a certain level, and you would like to see, okay, if there is a value to, uh, to the mannitol, you give it as boluses intermittently. Always will have to measure your serum osmolarity so that you do not make a mistake. So at least I taught you about measurement. This is my favorite thing because uh, I don't know if you've ever lived in a snowy country, the first thing that will dictate whether a mayor can stay in office or not stay in office is after the first snow, if he puts uh, salt on the, on the snow, on the road. If there are not enough salting trucks, the mayor will probably lose his office in the next election. Okay? So Very just want to add one, just want to add mm -hmm. one point, sir. Yeah, I mean, patients with renal failure and injury, please don't wait because mannitol effect on the cerebral edema doesn't depend on diuresis. So it is not a Absolutely. contraindication. Yes. Okay. But again, as I say, mannitol will be effective only in patients with an intact preserved autoregulatory auto mechanism. Correct. If they don't have an autoregulation, which you can't predict by the nature of their injury, okay, you, you, it will be not effective. So I would insist that if you're going to use mannitol, you should have intracranial pressure monitoring options. Okay, This is, again, one point of view, Okay, but it's a logical point of view. I want you to understand that. Because very typically what you'll give, mannitol one gram per kg initial dose, then fourth hourly, quarter gram per kg every, I mean, no, six hourly, eight hourly, whatever you want to do, decide. That's completely wrong, completely wrong. And that they'll also combine it with a lot of Lasix to create the diuresis and, and the uh, quote unquote hyperosmolar state that you wanted. Okay, neither of which is completely right. Uh, anything else that we missed? Anybody? There are some Advanced questions. Monitoring, there are some Advanced questions monitoring, sir. Advanced monitoring. Pardon me? The role of CSF drainage. And how do we prognosticate patients in traumatic okay. brain injury? Now, in this particular patient uh, presentation, we didn't have an opportunity to discuss the role of intracranial pressure monitoring and 
uh, the what you call your staged approach to ma managing intracranial uh, hypertension. Okay. Um, I don't know whether I, I'm right now prepared to give you the information because I don't know whether it is well organized in my head right now. Okay. But, but I, do, I do believe that there are st uh, st stages in the management of your ICP ele elevation. The initial aspect of it is what we call as normalization of everything. Make sure that the patient is adequately sedated, is quiet and uh, kept in bed in a normal position. Volume status is adequate. Uh, sodium and glucose is maintained adequately. Okay, If with that alone, the ICP seems to be under control, you don't do anything else. The next stage will be if the ICP continues to rise, and if you have an intracranial pressure monitor option, and if it is usually a fluid-filled catheter or where you have an option of, of a ventricular drain that is available, letting out the, uh, the draining of the fluid seems to be the primary thing that you will use, along with maybe bolus doses of osmotic agents. Okay, We very rarely would consider you know, hyperventilation unless you're going to consider taking the patient in okay. for emergency uh, procedures at the same time. Okay. Uh, then you take it to the next stage, which includes, uh, I don't remember at this stage, is the hypothermia included? Hypothermia, yeah, yeah. hypothermia okay. barbiturates, and then decra. Barbiturates, then again, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. all of which become, frankly, experimental kind of uh, management. So letting out the cerebrospinal fluid and anti-edema measures uh, with appropriate baseline sedation would be the second step. And the next step will be to go in, going into uh, processes that are usually not proven efficacious that will include, uh, as you said, barbiturate coma, hypothermia, uh, and maybe before you consider that, uh, say a decompression is definitely a consideration that you will have, surgical decompression, uh, including a hemicraniectomy under those conditions. Okay. Uh, is that a reasonable? Pardon me, I'm sorry? Prognostic Prognostication. Yeah, there are two models. One is impact prognostication model, model and other one is the crash, crash model. model. Yeah. They do, yeah. Uh, yeah, they consider the age of the patient, the motor response, the CT findings, uh, pupillary response, uh, and uh, the labs as well, uh, including hemoglobin and glucose. Apart from that, if the patient had hypoxia or hypotension, based on all these criteria, uh, they prognosticate about 14-day mortality and six-month mortality on the different mm. mo models. Okay. All right. That's more than I knew. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I was familiar. I was clearly familiar with the crash uh, prognostication model. Okay. But I think it is very valid in terms of uh, knowledge about the, the prognostication in these patients. What will be very surprising is the fact that even people with what seemed like a relatively minor injury can be left with major deficits for very long periods of time. So I think these models will give you a much better, more objective kind of a determination of that. Um, so what else did we see? Is there any other questions that we missed? Yeah, this, this, this is an interesting question. So how long would you give your osmolar therapy? Oh, okay. This is, again, a very interesting kind of an answer. If it is mannitol that is going to be the osmolar therapy, you continue to give it when you have a persistent elevation of your ICP that is refractory to the other management processes. So if you started off with uh, elevated ICP, and you gave the mannitol, there was a response, wonderful. If the ICP continues to go up, you'll also probably add the CSF drainage at the same time. If that alone in that combination doesn't work, you continue to give the ICP as long as the ICP remains responsive, okay? But you will add other the therapies at the same time, okay? So if you want better sedation, if you want to do decompression, all that will be added. Once you go on to decompression, the monitoring of the ICP, again, doesn't make any kind of sense. So that is under conditions when you're monitoring it for osmolar therapy. So mannitol will be given only as long as it is going to be effective and is needed over and above other therapies. As far as 3% saline is concerned, and if you're going to use it empirically like we do it, okay, under these circumstances, the data from this COBE trial is very interesting. This COBE trial very clearly said that they gave for an average of about three days of 3% of saline to most of these patients. And yes, during the three days that they gave, there was a reduction in the frequency of events associated with an elevated ICP. Okay, But when they stopped it, 
there was a tendency for a rebound. rebound. Okay, so this was stopped within three days. So my own feeling is, if you initiate a three percent saline, try to bring the sodium down over a longer period of time. Do not initiate or stop it abruptly just because the patient had an initial recovery. Just probably, this is again an extrapolation of this idea. Okay. And this is what I'm taking from the COBE trial. Again, remembering that COBE trial used 20% uh, saline, not 3% or anything of the sort, but the 3% will be associated with a little bit more benign kind of our option. I don't know. The recommendation I traditionally would say, I will take five to six days before I start tapering it off. Okay. And generally watch them on a, a reasonably slow kind of a basis at that time. Okay. If there's any difference of opinion, you're very welcome to ask. Uh, simultaneous use of hypertonic saline and mannitol. If you want to guarantee renal disease, if you want to put the patient on dialysis, uh, if you want to generate more income, uh, you're welcome to do that. Especially if you want to use hypertonic saline, mannitol, and Lasix. Okay. Yeah. Somebody talked about the tiered approach. I, that is the kind of words that I don't remember, but that is basically what I was trying to say about the ICP monitoring, the tiered approach, which has from the stages zero, one, two, three, as you go up, okay? Uh, usually starting with easily doable kind of ICP monitoring, uh, I mean, ICP therapeutic uh, approaches, and then going on to the others. Uh, TBI prognostication, somebody has written a, a long list. I, if you tell me that it is true, I believe it is true, okay? All long osmolar therapy, any role for ONST measurement in this case, why is somebody asking so late about ONSD? We kept insisting that it was a necessary uh, tool for this patient. Okay. Uh, maximum five to seven days. Somebody agrees with me. Can both mannitol and hypotonic be given in the same patient in an alternative manner, uh, along with a little bit of homeopathic therapy? Uh, <laughs> when you ask about alternate... <laughs> Okay, I wouldn't do that. Please don't. When you combine medications which have their own adverse effects, you will have a serious problem. Be careful about this kind of combination. Don't don't try and do that. Uh, how do we stop the osmona abruptly? That that is the kind of in, information that I gave you. That you try to do a taper. Uh, do we take repeat CT before starting anticoagulation or DVT prophylaxis? Usually, if the patient's uh, clinical prognosis is not in a negative direction and one follow-up CT has shown you that there was no progression of the bleed, I think we don't need to keep repeating the CT unless the patient has a deterioration. Um, so, I, okay, alcoholics and other antiplatelet agents definitely add to a complication. We can't do that very well. The, the last one is an interesting question, sir. Can we stop mannitol or hypertonic saline after decomposing craniectomy? Yeah. The answer to that will be, my answer would be yes. Do you have a different in the answer? Okay, my answer will be, after you've done a decompressive craniectomy, that is tier three of the management of your intracranial pressures, you hopefully will have, if you have sufficient um, you know, decompression, you don't need to continue uh, the, uh, the, uh, the anti-edema measure at that point in time. And as I said, that is what we said about mannitol. Mannitol, you continue to give it, as you progress up the tiers, and when you get all your other therapies to be effective, then you can stop the mannitol when you don't need it. As far as 3% is concerned, again, we probably will stop it once you have done a hemicraniectomy, okay? Even under our conditions of a hemicraniectomy, I don't think we will do anything uh, in terms of monitoring. Somebody said transclabarial herniation can occur if the ICP is high after a decompressive craniectomy. Uh, I'm not a neurosurgeon, so if you say so, I believe it. Somebody's asked for a reverse herniation occurring. I suppose it can occur, but that will have to be with appropriate uh, administration. I'm, I'm not very clear on that. Okay. I've got a lot of I'm not very clear kind of answers uh, more than I've had uh, real answers. There is some people putting on the chat box. There are other people putting questions on the Q&A. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Bonus. okay, that is done. Most of this has been answered, sir. Has been answered, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Any role for portable CPAP BiPAP machine in tracheostomized patient and a ward after a step down unit? We don't want to bring the patient with prolonged tracheostomy back to the ICU. 
I don't know. The answer is uh, about the use of BiPAP machines for a tracheostomized patient. I think it can be used very effectively. The one thing that you need to be very careful about using a BiPAP machine is the humidification that you achieve in that. More often than not, when you use those little portable machines, you do not put an adequate humidifier. And the bigger problem with tracheostomies is the inspissation of secretions. So if you have a standard protocol in which you check your inner tube, you check the thickness of your secretions, you make sure the patient is well hydrated, when the patient, make sure that the, um, the humidification is appropriate, all that will minimize the need for uh, uh, the potential rebound on the patient. Be very careful about the use of BiPAP machines. We can use it because that's what we typically do just to reduce quote-unquote cost, but it can be associated with the adverse outcome that you need to be careful about. Okay. Am I okay with that? Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I, just going back in hindsight, uh, this case, we could have taken it a little differently. You know, uh, Maybe what you should have done is presented a case where there was a rising ICP, and uh, in which case we could have taken your uh, discussion through the tiered approach that we wanted to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But when I saw this case, I basically decided that you're not going to do that. So I didn't brush up on my information at that point. So I don't want to be lying uh, to you and getting you into trouble. Okay. Um, so is there anything else that you wanted to add? Pensham, anything else that I missed? Mm. Uh, Any... Multimodal monitoring or the advanced neuro monitoring. Where do you see the role? Brain tissue oxygenation, uh, transcranial Doppler. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, those are all okay. The, the logical uh, extensions, but probably but none of them have actually shown to have any major benefit. With any major impact in terms of availability? Yes. Yeah. In yes. outcomes yet, though people would argue that that gives you more appropriate levels of information about the management because routine management of ICP-based therapies don't necessarily cause an improvement in outcome. That is the the famous uh, South South American trial, which on uh, the Colombian trial, if I remember right. Basically, ICP monitoring or no monitoring. Best trip. Best, Best trip, trip. Exactly. Best trip. That that was a, a ICP directed kind of a therapy that, where you yes. basically attempted to keep the ICP less than twenty, uh, with or without monitoring. Uh, it didn't make a difference in outcome. Mm -hmm. So, bringing your ICP down by itself is not a a good enough goal. The value of multimodality monitoring comes in because that will give you greater amounts of information about when you need to bring the ICP down and when you need to manipulate other aspects of the uh, uh, cerebral perfusion. Okay, we're not talked about it at, at, at this point. Okay. I think we've yes. done enough. Okay. Yeah. Shall we? Shall yeah. 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 No, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you for enlightening all the students on TBA management. Uh, we can conclude the sessions. Was it adequate? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. yes, sir. We'll get feedback. All we'll get aspects feedback. are covered. We'll yeah. get feedback. Anyway. I think we have Thank covered you. most of it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, thank you for the presentation, both of you. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I think the presentations were good. I think we could have picked a little bit of a sophisticated case. Uh, maybe that, that would have had me reading a little bit more and doing a little bit more discussion. Okay. Sir, Dr. Thank Fola. you. Yeah, thank you, sir. It, it was actually, we all were enjoying it. Um, uh, few things I enjoyed is your honesty, even with the so much of wisdom, you express yourself when you don't know, I say, I don't know it. You go, you go back and work on yourself. And um, both of you, uh, Dr. Anwar and Dr. Sumaya, both of you were excellent in presenting a case, bringing a case to us. And as I said, uh, if you could have been making it more complex, would have been brought a little more issues into the case. But uh, most of the areas has been well covered, sir. And um, uh, we thank both of you for your valuable time. Thank you, Gansyam, uh, for giving us time and uh, spending some uh, an hour and a half with all our students. Uh, I think uh, this will definitely help them because uh, the traumatic brain injury trauma uh, as a topic is not been exposed to many students uh, where there is a mixed medical issues. So burns, trauma, poisoning, these are all not been covered in many of the medical issues. So I think uh, this will definitely help our students in this. And thank you so thank much. You. Sir. 
Maybe we should add one more case in which the ICP monitoring aspects are, are taken in a sequential way. That's I think great. that would have been a useful thing. Probably we'll add Same that way. and bring in the like a second session, sir. And we will uh, yeah. come. Maybe yeah, more I, I complex you, like, traumatic brain injury case. Yeah, I'll read up a little bit and come. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sasi. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you everybody. And all the best, guys. Thanks. Thank you. All the thank you. Yeah, you'll do well. You seem Thanks. to have confidence enough to do well. You'll do well. Thank Great. you. Thank you.